is what it does to me. Um, so I had a question from a viewer on YouTube, um, Daniel Lewis. Oh, I should introduce this first of all. So this is, uh, I'm programming Python 3.4, uh, PyQt5. I'm building an application to use while we play role-playing games with my kids to manage all the numbers and stuff and the dice rolls. So we can focus on role-playing right now. It's called JGRPG Tools. It is hosted at GitHub. I'll try to provide a link below. Um, GitHub.com slash JGARDNER JGERDNER1 slash JGRPG Tools. Uh, you can download and look at it. It is open source. I believe it's licensed with a GPL. So you can make modifications or distribute it if you want to. As long as you can perform, of course, with the GPL. So it's, it's free software. Uh, free as in freedom, of course. Um, the purpose of the series is, of course, to explain programming. This is really geared towards my kids, but I know there's a lot of people out there that want to program but have no idea how to get started. And I love to mentor and coach and teach. Anyway, so Daniel Lewis asked me a question. Um, he says, hi, I'm using Windows 10, Python 3.4, PyQt5. I have tried multiple ways, and I just couldn't get it to work. I'm looking for a step-by-step -step all the way through to opening a .py file that loads the GUI of a single project, and I appreciate your help. Um, so I was able to get it working on Windows. Um, I do intend to, let's, let's walk through that right now. So I'm going to switch to window capture. So I'm going to have the Fedora instance here, which is VirtualBox running in the background. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit, here, let's go, Control-Alt-S. That is not showing up on your screen for some reason. Let's see if so I'm doing uh, when I'm in Windows 8 not Windows 10 I probably not gonna upgrade to Windows 10 for some time unless I have to I just I'm not happy with the decisions they made about privacy and things like that so uh, github as an application you can download let's bring that up let's see if it'll show up on the screen and it is not showing up on the screen not window capture um, Let's, let's make a new scene called, uh, okay, and add a source. JJ, I need to go. Monitor one. That's not working, obviously. Uh, pardon my technical incompetence here. Yeah, so that's the wrong screen. I have two screens here. So it is supposed to be screen one. Let's see what happens if I move it around. Yeah, you can see my cursor, but you can't see that window. So I'm going to switch to uh, a window capture. And I'm going to call this one. capture that there we go I apologize it is not centered um, see if I move the window you don't see anything move so I have checked out JTRPG tools here let's actually do um, what does this do pull from master pull request just do seek I'm used to the command line version of git not this github UI thing but the command line version of Windows is very difficult to get right I'm pulling down nine changes, which should be done by now, but it's not. Um, okay, so right click here, open an explorer, brings up a window. Um, add a window capture for the explorer. And, yep, yeah, that's what I want to open. Okay. Let's close GitHub. That's Explorer. Sorry about the incompetence here. And I think if I hit open, this will work. There. Yeah, it works. How did that work? Well, edit with Vim. Let's bring up the Vim window. Oh, oh, Vim monitor capture is not working. Add 
and no capture. I have a laptop, and laptops behave oddly. Um, yeah, that's it. Let's make this full screen here. Okay, why is that not resizing? That's just that's just annoying. There we go. Okay. This is the shebang line, which means nothing to Windows. This is a very common paradigm in the Unix world. Uh, shebang, sharp bang. So sharp exclamation point or hash exclamation point. If the first line of a text file starts with those two characters, it's a signal to the Unix um, environment, to the bit of code that actually runs programs, that this is a special text file that's supposed to be interpreted as a script and run this command line and pass the contents of this file into it. So basically this executes user bin in Python 3, this file name. It doesn't mean anything to Windows, obviously. So import sys from PyQt 5Qt widgets, import Q application from JGRPG main window, import main window, if name equals main, and I believe that I read that this has to appear this way. You can't put it into a main function. App equals Q application sys argv. So sys.argv, when you run a program in Unix, you can provide an arbitrary number of parameters. And what it does is it splits those by white space and it puts them into the argv array. And if you're familiar with C programming, you'll recognize this in your C uh, function's main signature. They pass in like an arg C and an argv. Arg C is the arg count and argv is the vector, the pointer to the pointer of arguments. Create the main window. So in Python, we don't have a new operation. If you want to create an instance of a class, you just call it as a function. And that calls the init method of the class. Uh, main window dot show, that's a instruction to the Qt environment to actually draw the elements into the window. And then finally, app.exec. This enters the execution loop. Like many programs that you write, especially when you're doing game programming, you write an event loop. Uh, an event loop is a bit of code that circles around. It just runs again and again and again waiting for some kind of input, some kind of thing that might change the program state, such as a user moving the mouse, typing in text, clicking the close button, making the window a different size, respond to that event appropriately. And so that runs the exec loop. And the only way to get out is to cancel or end the execution loop. Um, there's a couple functions you can call. In Python, you can also hit control C, which would cancel it. So let me go back to Explorer here. Let me switch back to the Explorer window. Let me make this one modify here. Okay. So you'll notice that my JGRPG toolkit.py has this funky little symbol next to it. That's because I taught um, I taught uh, Microsoft Windows how to open those files. So anything with a .py is associated with the Python launchers for Windows. Now how did I install this? I, it's been a while since I've installed it and frankly if I were to try to install it again it probably wouldn't work. So let me open up a Firefox session. Close all the other tabs and things. Okay, don't want you to see my calendar and stuff. So, Okay, there is my DuckDuckGo search for PyQt. This is the official link, Riverbank Computing. So you go over here to Downloads, PyQt5. And 
this is the tar gz. Tar gz is a format that's very common in the Linux universe. This is the zip file, but this is the source. You can't install source. So you have to go down to binary packages. You have to choose between Qt4 and Qt5. Please choose Qt5. Qt4 is really old, and Qt5 has so many awesome things that you don't even want Qt5 anymore. Um, note that the Qt documentation is not included. That's true. Choose the right platform, 64 or 32 bit. Most likely you're running a 64 bit computer, unless you have a really old computer. And you're going to download this file. Bam. Then after you download it, you're going to go over here and open it and run it. And that will install PyQt5. Um, you should also get Python 3. So let's go to Python. Search for Python, python.org. This shouldn't be too difficult for most people. The thing that they miss, though, is this additional configuration you need to do for Windows. Um, please use Python 3.4. Um, unless you're working for a company or you're working on code that is Python 2.7 or 2 less, please use 3.4. So this download link takes you to a page here. And then down here is the files. And you have a Windows MSI installer for 64-bit that you want to run. Okay. Uh, note that you're not done after you, well, maybe you are, but you have to do some hacking on the registry to change your uh, path to include Python. I didn't do that. I just manually put things in. I found the file and put it in. Okay. There's actually in Windows, there's two Pythons. There's Python W and Python.exe. Python W runs it in a windowed mode, so it doesn't show the console, because Python expects there to be an input or an output, just like any program should in the Unix environment. So that's basically all there is to it. Um, if I haven't answered a question, feel free to ask. Okay, we're going to go out of here, out of there, out of there, and I'm going to go to programming. There we are. So I'm back in Linux. I like Linux. It's so much easier to program in Linux. So I hope that answered your question, Daniel. Um, is there a way to do a highlight? I don't know. I'll have to figure out Twitch one day. Um, I am open to questions. Ask me questions, whatever form you can find to get to me. I have an email address, jggames at jonathangarder.net. Hopefully that's available. You can find it. Um, I don't mind the spam. I used to work at Amazon on the email team way back when. And I put my email address out on the internet so that I can get all the spam on the internet. So I can train my filters. So the more spam you send me, the better my filters work. It's always kind of nice seeing what people are spamming lately. Okay, so last time I did this, I got seriously confused and frustrated. And I basically stopped wanting to program. And that's a very childish response to running into something hard in programming. Um, my CEO of the company explains that sometimes you want to build moats, basically things that nobody else can build or they're difficult to build. And so it just makes sense for people to come to you um, for help or to use your code. So if your code is easy and anybody can replicate it, then the likelihood of you actually making a difference in the world is very low. If it's very something hard, then it's worth doing right. Okay. So um, the part where I got stuck is I have this loop that I built, a parallel event loop. The code is in here, hiding somewhere. You can add events that are supposed to happen at a certain time. So you can say, like, in six seconds, move to the combat resolution phase between combat and, and resolve the combat. Or you can say, and then after that's done, it says, okay, now immediately move back into the combat declaration phase or whatever. The, it works great. It works perfectly. And um, the only issue that I ran into was uh, serialization, which I haven't done yet. I was just thinking ahead. When I store the game, 
I have to store things that you can put into a JSON file, basically text. And if I can't convert something into text, then I can't store it. So I can't have in these objects things like function references. Because in Python, there's not a good way. Well, there could be a way that I can say, hey, build up this function reference. But really, it's just better to store as a name and some parameters that can be stored. So avoid using function references. So I, I, wrote, I started hacking on this function called ask as part of the game. And the ask function basically says, hey, we need to ask the users for some input. I have these questions. And when they're done, I want to go to this next step whatever that is, some function. Call this function when they answer all the questions. And um, so this is what I have so far, which is wrong. The first thing I do is I lock the timer. So the timer is an element. Let me show you what the timer is. I don't even know if this is going to run. OK, it works. So this is the timer. It's a clock widget that you can stick anywhere. Um, and every time you click, it advances the time of the universe. OK. so. You can imagine there can be a button here for like one month. And during that time, things happen. Things can happen. I haven't programmed anything to happen, but things can happen. Um, so for combat, you do all the declaration and stuff until everything's ready. And then the game master would click to go to the next round. And so time would advance that way. So there's a universal clock that you can plug into and things like that. Control Q gets you out. So all of these warnings here, I'm not really sure what's causing these warnings. I think it has to do with how the OpenGL driver works with um, with VirtualBox. I just ignore them. But if you notice, these are all OpenGL warnings. But if there's other warnings, you should pay attention to it. That's a skill in programming that I strongly encourage people to develop is look at the warnings, look at the errors. Um, somebody took some time to write that for you, so read it. OK. So this ask um, would lock the timer. Then there's this function on answer that you call when a question is answered, right? And so you take these question objects and you assign the on answer as a parameter that's actually a function, which in Python is perfectly okay. The problem is, is you can't serialize that. You know, if, if I stop the program and try to load it from disk, where is on answer going to be? Okay. And then there's the show method to actually show the question to the user, kind of mirroring what QT does. So a question is really a graphical element in, in a sense, you know. It has, of course, data elements to it, but it also has a graphical element to it. So you're showing the question to the user so they can click and choose an answer or type something in. So on answer says if all of the questions are done, then clear the answer function and call the answer method. This is a method or function that's passed in and call that with the questions as result and release the timer. Probably should release the timer first. Not that I'm going to use this code, I'm going to rewrite it. So the frustration that I ran into is, uh, first of all, I can't use the answer DN, the answer callback. And I have to make sure that everything's serializable all through the process. At first I was going to fudge and say, well, it's OK if we have to ask the same question again. But now I'm like, no, I'm going to need it. I'm going to need these answers to these questions to be serialized so that you can restore and start the game midway through a round, for instance, of combat. And so um, I got frustrated. I, I quit. And thinking about it, I'm like, you know what? If it's hard, it's worth doing, right? So I thought that. And the second thing I thought is there is a way to figure even extremely complicated things out and to do it right the first time. It takes discipline, it takes practice, but it can be done. My background is physics. Uh, show me a math problem, I will eventually find an answer for it. I know enough tools that I can figure it out. Um, so there really isn't anything that you can do to stop me at math, because I've seen enough, I've, I've, I've understood enough methods that I know how to go and find the right answer, and, and find the right method to find the answer. How do you do that for programming? What's the method of finding the solution to a programming problem? And in earlier videos, I've talked about how every program is really a state machine. And state machines are difficult to understand. They have some issues with the fact that as they get more and more complicated, 
we can't understand them anymore. We just can't keep it in our brains, right? But state machines are a very simple concept. And it's just like one plus one equals two can, can get you to the next step, which is like two times four is eight. And then three to the second power is nine and all the way up to whatever you wanna to go to. The, the fundamental concepts are easy, but seeing how to use them to solve a problem is hard. And if you're not careful, the complexity can get away from you and you can build a mess that you cannot work on anymore. Um, that's actually a common experience with programs is you start writing a program, you keep adding to it and keep adding to it and keep adding to it. Eventually it's a big mess and you'd rather start over than fix the mess. So um, try to use techniques to write a program that you can keep adding to, you don't want to throw away eventually. Um, and some of those techniques you see on the screen right here. We have doc strings in Python. This is documentation for that function. We have comments. We have little notes to myself or to future programmers. Um, myself being a future programmer, I need to understand the program as if I'd never seen it before if I come back to it. So I have to write to myself as if uh, I didn't know who I was. Um, I write messages as if I was an idiot. I don't assume that I know anything because I know how stupid I can be sometimes. At the same token, when you're solving a complicated math problem, you write very carefully so that you don't confuse your twos with sevens um, or z's and uh, you carefully walk through the steps you don't try to do a lot in your head because you know from experience that you often get problems wrong just by simple stupid mistakes like forgetting to carry the one or something like that so treat yourself like an idiot and don't get offended when people treat you like an idiot because really we're all idiots together okay so i'm going to show you a technique to do this so I am going to go and I want to start a new, I want to draw. Where is it? OO Draw is a tool that I, LibreOffice free software. And I'm going to draw. I could use Inkscape too. Inkscape is pretty good. Uh, there's a couple other older tools that people are used to using. Um, let's just help lines while moving. Let's use that. Hey, I turned you on, man. Okay, so I'm going to draw states. This is uh, no questions. Okay. And another state would be Questions pending. Okay. So in a program, I want to have snap to grid on. How do I turn snap to grid on? What does that say? Hyperlink, chart, image, arrow style. You know what? Ignore it. This is more for me than you, and I'm not going to publish this. So a state in a program is basically if you were to take a snapshot of what the program looks like at that moment, okay? You think about what is the next instruction the program is going to execute? What does the memory look like? This is at a very low level. Where's the program pointer, the program counter? Like where is it pointed to in memory? What's the next instruction it's going to run? And this is just data. It's just a series of numbers. In Python, we don't program at that level. We think what function are we in? What's the state of the callbacks and the objects? What's going to happen if this happens? What's going to happen if that happens? Right? So let's think about what can happen. So when there's no questions pending in this state diagram, only in this aspect of the program, well obviously, let's do this one actually. You can go boop, 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 and we need arrows arrows. How do I add an arrow here? I'm an idiot. There we go. Start here. Start here. See how idiotic I am? start here and go there okay 
Now what does this represent? This represents ask. So somewhere in the code, the function ask is called. And now there's questions pending. Okay. Well, what can happen? Well, when we ask, we might be asking a group of questions. Okay. So when one of those questions gets answered, maybe Okay. It's called follow up. Let's move this guy down. So maybe the question is answered, but there's follow up questions. I'm just doing pseudocode here. Or maybe all, come on, dude, all questions answered. Okay. Okay. So in the questions pending state, we're going to have some data elements. And what is this? Yeah. So the data we're going to have, and I'm just going to write this down. You go here. Okay. Thinking of the data because oftentimes, once you understand what the data looks like, the functions, the code becomes obvious. So, data pending questions not answered, or questions were answered, but other questions still are pending in the group. Okay, so no questions pending, questions pending. Okay, so ask. So the other thing to, to note worthy is to note is that the uh, timer is locked. Okay, I can't think of questions that wouldn't lock the timer. There are things you can do, like there's the question of what do you do now, what do you do now, that kind of thing. But the default, there's a really good default answer: do nothing, right? Um, but there are any questions that I can think of that you would ask, but not lock the timer until you get an answer, right? When you're asking a question, you're saying, hey, I need an answer before I can continue with the code. So that's what it means, okay? So obviously when there's no questions pending, there's no unanswered questions, questions answered, but other questions still pending in the group. So the data structure should become obvious now. So we have a set of questions. The questions may or may not have an answer, okay? Now the other transitions, this is what we have to think of as well. What happens when you start the program? And, or you load, game load, let's call it. So after the game is loading, well, you may be going to this one, or you may be going to that one, right? depending on whether or not there's questions. So this data now becomes obvious. You store this data. When the game loads, it looks to see if there's any pending questions. Then it appropriately locks the timer, puts things, organizes things like they're supposed to be, and puts it, the game into the state. Okay? And every time you answer a question, it goes like this. It may go here, or it may go this way, depending on whether all the, all the questions are answered. So really, let's draw a little diamond. Okay, so we have this decision point. So this point over here. Okay. 
okay okay let's move this around here a little bit okay okay So the game has to have this data that says, what are the questions currently pending? Probably organized by groups. There's an answer method that is called when one of those questions gets answered. Okay. It has to set up those questions when it first loads so that they get drawn on the screen. Okay. And then when a question gets answered due to some kind of user response, we either go to this state where there's no questions pending or this state where there are questions pending. So this has really helped me clear up what I need to do. And I think I can translate this into code and make it work. So I'm going to leave this up here, go to, go to my code, and start plucking away with this. Okay, so question groups, okay. And for now, it's just gonna be straightforward. Array, I could use a set, I don't think it really matters. Okay, so what does ask really do? Let's actually go up here and what do I call this method another no character Update data load replaces the contents with the new contents. So basically the the constructor is called with the data that's loaded from disk. So Timer locks will depend. We'll probably calculate those. Actually, let's do that. And there's going to be a lot of parameters here, so let's just let's add them in like this. Something about Python 3.4 that's frustrating is there's no final comment in the argument list, I believe. So event queue.
there is going to be a small problem. I'm going to do a copy here by making a new list from it. Um, the reason why, you know what? No, 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 let's do this way. So if if I had an array, a list as a parameter, that same list will get passed to every single instance. Okay. So that will restore from disk. And then we could have a, uh, what is it called? Data returns the data. This will return the parameters to the init function. did count such a horrible name. Um, I'm going to call it something else. Uh, we call it an ID sequence. Okay, why the underscore? Underscore attributes are private, but not formally. Python is a very laissez-faire uh, type system where you can do whatever you want. Um, it makes no sense to me to write a program where you intentionally cut off attributes from yourself. If you really want to access it, you should be allowed to access it. Hey, Dan Lu 12 I answered your question earlier. I assume you're the same Dan Lu, so was emailing me. I answered your question earlier, um, so it's, it's in the first like 20 minutes of this stream. We're at the minute 38 right now. Um, so I got this data method. Okay, so that should work. Okay, so the current time is stored in this underscore current time. That means it's a private variable, private member. Don't access it unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, access is, of course, not restricted. And sometimes you see a, a dunder, a double under. This will actually change it to like the class name because you don't want to overwrite any other class's attribute there. You want to give yourself a unique attribute name. So um, if you want to access the current time, you use this property called current time without the underscore, and it just returns it. And then if you want to set it, you use this method. And we have to make sure that you can't travel backwards in time. I know the temptation is great, but unfortunately, the laws of this universe won't allow it. And uh, otherwise, it has to emit this current time changed event to let the rest of the universe know that the time has changed. Timer locked. You add locks. You remove locks. It's just a count right now. Um, in the future, I might want to have a reason why or who locked it for what reason. Um, lock timer locks a timer. Increments the count blah 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 release the timer so these methods have to do with the timer um, really this could probably separate it out into its own object but I don't really see a reason to do that add event tick ask okay this is where we get fun so ask is going to go from this state where there's no questions pending to the state where there are questions pending and it's going to show the questions 
It's going to lock the timer. We're going to get rid of this. This is going to be a special object with special parameters. The question that got answered and the answer. And because of this diagram over here, when you answer a question, you have to make a decision. Is that all of them? Then you go to this no questions pending state. Otherwise, you go to questions pending state. And so in this case, so I'm not going to code. You know what? I'm going to code something very simple. There we go. It's pretty easy, isn't it? And then question dot for if question dot group dot all answered then we go self dot question groups remove Yeah, you know what? I'll just transfer that to question.answer. This is actually going to be a method of a question. Just makes more sense that way. Hmm. Is there a difference between a single quote and a triple quote? Uh, no. Well, yes, but it's a very minor difference and it's obvious. So can it span line? Yeah. Okay, so it's a syntax error to end without a question a quotation mark at the end. So that's fine. If you do triple quotes, however, you can span that. And if you look closely, it's adding new lines, right? So triple quote span multiple lines. Obviously, if you want to put uh, a double quote in a double quote, well, that's going to be a syntax error. So you use backslash. And in triple quotes, you don't need that backslash. Well, you do if it's the last character. But if it's not the last character, then it's fine. And if it is the last character, you just escape it. So there you go. Um, you, there's something else that most people don't know. 
So it doesn't work in this guy, but when you're writing up code, that is counted as one string. Um, if it's part of a parameter list, or if you do the line concatenation thing at the end. So um, also the first string that appears after a class or def is the doc string. So even if I put that will count as a doc string, not this one. So the special strings right after the, the function declaration is special. Okay, so I have this weird little case. This weird little case, we have to have a show. Oh, there's, there's a show method up here. I'm, I'm bonkers here. Let's call that set answer. Looks like I was on the right path before. Question group is a group of questions. Oftentimes, you need several answers before you can resolve the next action. For instance, the comment that gave me to know what every character will do before attempting to resolve the actions. Note that sometimes a question may spawn more questions, so we can't do a simple check whether the original questions were answered. We have to check that all the questions and their subsequent questions are all subsequent questions are all answered before continuing. So each question locks the timer. That's an interesting idea. That way it's not the question group that locks the timer, but the questions. more of a reminder of what, what I have to do. I use double quote, blah, 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 triple quote, three and three, and it shows as one string. Sorry if I'm throwing you off. No problem. Random questions are, are appreciated. So I'm going to mute, lower the table, and then unmute. I can 
mute it, I would. All right, unmuted. No, I'm not going to apply. No, that's not that's stupid. In combat, um, See, if I, if I had the answer of the question feed into some other function to actually calculate the results, that would be moving the code that applies the answer to the question from the question itself, which makes little or no sense. Um, the other problem is if I remove this question from the group, there's no way to go back and say, okay, what were the question answers? Because it's not going to have it. It's going to be empty when it's all done, okay? which is what I want it to do really is, is, is basically here's a bunch of questions. Work through these until they all disappear. Um, so if there's a follow-up question, then we ask that, um, which really should be part of the init. Weak ref. Proxy, that's what it is, proxy. Yeah, from weak ref import proxy, um, five second explanation of proxy. So in Python, there the variables or the members of a class or the names in a scope point to objects. Python counts how many things are pointing to those objects. A weak ref does not increment the count of the object. So if you can have circular references where something refers to something that refers back to itself, if one of those references is a weak ref, then when the object that has the strong ref is removed, then the weak ref as well is lost. So in this case, if you had the circular reference, um, the object would never get garbage collected because um, they're basically keeping each other alive. So. Question text. Let's call it text because of course it's a question text. That's a pet peeve of mine. You have a database that says this is the this is the uh, agents, and then you have agent name, agent title. And it's like, of course we're talking about the agent. Just say name and title. So of course this is the question text. And self.options equals options. Okay. Let's close this window and get some more horizontal space out. Um,
So there's a potential of having lots and lots of question classes. Okay, Lauren 1350. This would be more interesting if I had more pre-existing knowledge of Python or what you were doing, or if I were more awake and able to compensate for the lack, which is mainly to say that I will be interested in seeing this another time. All right, take care, Lauren. Um, yeah, I'm just, this is what I do for fun. I program. Okay, so this question, so the UI, uh, very quickly, what this is is a program to help um, help people play RPGs, tabletop RPGs. It'll take care of all the complicated rules, the dice rolls, and everything like that. Um, I'm trying to get combat to work in the most basic way possible. So basically, what's going to happen is when combat starts, we have to ask all the characters, or rather the players of those characters, what the character is going to do. Are they going to attack or defend or whatever? And so we have to ask that question. The questions will get answered in a non-serial way. So it's not going to say, okay, player A, player B, player C. It's going to ask them all three at the same time. And then one after the other or whatever order they want, they're going to answer the questions. When all the questions are answered, it's going to kick it off to the next stage and resolve the combat actions. And um, then it'll go back to start the, the round again. You know, So I, I want to write that code, basically. Um, and so I need to represent how questions can work. I'm programming in PyQt5, as the title says, uh, Python 3, and the project is called JGRPG Tools. You can find the code at github.com slash jgardner1 slash jgrpg tools. So it's, it's a free software GPL, I believe. So we don't need to do this. It will add itself. putting that note in there for myself in the future in case I want to add follow-up questions. Um, may want to... There's no reason to record this. The question object will disappear when it's done. We are very close to coming in to the result here. I'm not going to have an ask method. Basically, you create questions. You create question groups. You add the questions to the group. As you create them, the question group, when all the questions are answered, So I can't store um, partials. Partials are this concept that comes from, I can't do that. Um, it comes from functional programming. Basically, let's say you have a function that takes three parameters, a, b, and c, okay? And you want to make a new function that only takes one parameter, 
and basically calls the first function with the first two parameters set to a certain value. So let's say you have a function that says uh, you know, sum of two numbers, sum of a and b, and it returns a plus b. Um, you want to say sum 5. So you say sum 5 is equal to partial of sum with the first parameter being 5. So sum 5 can take one parameter. Sum 5 of 7 would return 12 or whatever. So um, partials are useful that way. Uh, in Python, they're especially useful because oftentimes you want a partial that has keyword arguments set as well. I can't use partials because when I set the parameter of an object to a partial, how do I serialize that to a disk? It can't be done. It can't be done. And I'm not going to use dill. Not going to use dill. I can't use dill. Important. Um, pickle. Pickle. No, I'm just going to use JSON. Partial. Got to get rid of partial. Okay. I think I'm ready to actually code combat. I think this will work. I have some plugins that I have to do for showing the question. When you restore a question from disk, it's going to call init. That's event on a question. Let's put this note inside of the body of this class. This is one of the reasons why I like vim. Watch. I do gqap. Bam. Um, gq says format um, the width of the text. And ap says a paragraph. So gqap. Um, Obviously, these are going to change based on the, the question type. How do I store the group that it belongs to? I don't. I don't. do all the management of the group parameter here. Take a append. It's the right method and then
So there's an issue here. You know, maybe I should just write this this uh, encoding function. If it encounters an object that's not one of the standard objects, it uh, calls data on it. Use that instead, or it kind of stores all the objects in a non-nested method. So, anyway. The serialized method for data would use a system of IDs and things. I believe I've already done that. Oh, I have to remember how to do that. Okay, let's get to writing the combat. Okay, start combat. Begins combat between two groups. Checks that they're not fighting. Blah, 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 blah. Adds the event to ask for character input. So it's going to do... Um, combat decision phase start and it's going to be past A comma B. So what does add event do? Self time event name args and keyword args. There it goes. So then combat decision phase start. Get input for all the characters in combat. Check that they're actually fighting and Pose all the questions to the player. Self.ask. We're not going to call self.ask. For So it has to register itself with the question groups here in the game when it's created. That's something I'm not doing right now.
So it basically registers itself with the game. Let's see, I've been going for an hour and 12 minutes. It's 1024, 1025. Okay. So we're going to create this new question group, right? So the way to read this is this way. For group and A, B. So for each of the A and B, set group to be A and then group to be B. And then for C and group, so group is a set of um, characters. C is the, each character in combat, all of them. Uh, generate this new combat question, passing in the character and then put that into an, a list that's stored in questions and then question group equals question group questions combat resolution phase comma a comma b so create the question group and register it with the game okay and when all those questions get answered go to the combat resolution phase passing in the parameters a comma b in the combat resolution phase There's the chance that depending on the intentions of another character, we may have to ask a character a question that could change. No, it's not going to change what they do. They do that in addition to whatever reaction they get. So, we don't have this weird callback thing that's going on here. So let's just kind of move that all out of the way. All right. I had the idea that it would keep calling this with more and more effects until everything's done, but that idea has been abandoned. So we're going to assume
So the way I'm going to do combat in this RPG is first everybody declares their intentions. Then you resolve those intentions, storing the effects, but you don't actually apply the effects until it's all done. And then after all the resolution has been taken care of, then you apply all the effects all at once. So it's quite possible for two characters to kill each other at the same time, for instance. Um, or for a wizard to cast freeze on somebody, but they are still able to get a hit out before they actually get frozen. So the idea is everything's happening at the same time. Um, there's no kind of initiative to give anybody an advantage over the other. Um, the dexterity and stuff don't affect it that way. It, it affects the chance of success or a beneficial result. Um, it doesn't give you the option of doing something and preventing the other guy from doing anything. I'm going to get rid of all this code. Okay. Okay, so 4C... Does that even work in Python 3? For A and B, for B and print A, they don't like that. Yeah, that's invalid. But if I do it like this, A for A and B for B and B is not defined. I have to do A afterwards. Yes. So that works. This is actually backwards. So this method It looks to me like the ask method is alive and well. It's just it's just an object, not a Maybe I just need to change that self.ask to Let's bring back ask.
some sea luggage in here. And in the application phase, we are going to go for group in A comma B. Sometimes the applications, there will be follow-up questions here as well. So I need this actually called you decide and then wait and then the resolution comes out. Six seconds later. Ugh. What should it be? So start combat. Starts it out. Decision, ask for decisions, resolves. Hmm, so I don't have a way. I need to add another function here. self time plus six
All right, so. We have some work to do. I need to design a UI element for the choose one question. run away. <sighs> B 
These will probably turn into objects at some point. Mm -hmm. Let's move the question object down. change its signature here. It's going to be a dummy. It's not going to have a group like that. Yes, it will. Because sometimes you want to Anyway, I think I've made pretty good progress today. I'm nowhere near to the point where I can run this code and see if it works. But I think I'm getting close. Thanks for watching. Take care and bye.